Good evening, everyone. It's Thursday, October 20th, 2016. I'm Morala Kathwari. And I'm Alexandra Garcia. Welcome to The Local Live. The mayor of the village of Amaranek filed suit against the Board of Trustees. Those details coming up. A teenage girl from White Plains is rescued from the clutches of human trafficking. The village of Amaranek proclaims October 20th as Community Media Day. There's a new mural in the village of Amaranek. This and more local stories in our segment in the media. The Westchester Tattoo Convention is in the spotlight this week. We're chatting with local bakers and Food Network's Cake Board finalists Jacqueline Dinko and Natasha Jagapot. Our sports producers are bringing us the best LMC Varsity Sports highlights of the week. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. On tonight's roundtable, we'll be talking to Jennifer Friedman of My Sister's Place. With elections fast approaching, we have new developments regarding the local referendum in the village of Amaranek. As we previously reported, two local laws, UNT, were passed on September 6 to add two referendum questions to the ballot. The first referendum question asks voters whether or not they want to transfer the mayor's power to appoint members of the Planning and the Zoning Board of Appeals to the Board of Trustees. The second question asks whether or not to transfer the mayor's power to the board when appointing a village attorney. However, Mayor Norman Rosenblum is challenging the legality of the two referendum questions in the New York State Supreme Court, and he is suing the Village of Amaranek Board of Trustees. I file papers with the court uh, in front of the judge, mm -hmm. and uh, they issue, it's a show cause order, and they have to uh, answer it. I'm presuming they would answer it. They'd be silly not to, because that's the action they took. They have to show why they believe that my action, my request, is not proper. Now, the judge will take... Uh, uh, testimony from both sides and he will make a decision as to uh, is it is it proper and and they should uh, find that the laws were legal and the process is wrong uh, or in fact it should just go ahead on the ballot now <clears throat> the irony is it's already on the ballot so what happened is let's presume the court finds in my favor mm -hmm. even though people vote for it uh, it wouldn't be counted but while you're doing this, I would just to make sure the people watching this, in any case, vote no against it. If you want to maintain a, 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 power, a, a balance of power, and this is the ultimate hypocrisy, because they're talking about abuse by the mayor and uh, appointing the, the village attorney and uh, members of the planning board and the zoning board. The fact of the matter is local law and local procedure they have now is I make the appointment they have to verify it. So there is a balance of power. It's just not unilateral, an appointment. So it shows the hypocrisy that they have. They have no value whatsoever for the concept of a balance of power in government. They are petty politicians that do nothing but looking for a power grip. Mayor Rosenblum also said that he was notified that the legal representatives of the Board of Trustees requested to move the court date, date to the 27th. We are currently producing a full in-depth report about the referendum that will air a week before the election. But for now, we will leave you with the response from David Finch regarding the lawsuit. Because if you go back to the LMC tapes of those meetings, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of jumping up and down and howling that the process was illegal, the process was flawed. Mm -hmm. um, the, the timing was such that the resolutions um, that had to be filed with the Board of Elections mm -hmm. were passed. Mm -hmm. They were filed by the, the village clerk with the Board of Elections promptly. Um, and quite frankly, I had expected, because Norman says, I'm going to sue, I'm going to sue, mm -hmm. within a day or two, have a suit. It came in yesterday. Um, beyond the, if it were done in a timely fashion, we can argue, and we have got support from attorneys and such, that it was, mm -hmm. while it was convoluted, to say the least, it was by the book, mm -hmm. and we've, we've checked it out with state authorities. Mm -hmm. All the timing was done, mm -hmm. a little confused, but it was done right. Uh, he says it wasn't. The problem he may face, and I believe he will, and I think it's gonna be resolved on Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, is that my read, at least, of the Board of Election uh, requirements is that there's a five-day window from the time of filing mm -hmm. 
in which someone could raise an objection. He's for, over those five days. Well, long past okay. those five days. A 16-year-old girl from White Plains has been rescued from human trafficking. The girl was found in Greenberg, New York by a team of FBI agents and local police. She is now being offered medical treatment as well as counseling. The girl was found due to the FBI's Innocence Loss Initiative. Part of this initiative is Operation Cross Country, which is an inter international effort targeting human trafficking. The FBI has been going across the United States investigating hotels, truck stops, and street corners where traffickers are usually found. The Innocent Loss Initiative has resulted in the rescue of over 6,100 children. Any child could fall victim to human trafficking, so it is important to be aware. If you believe that you have witnessed a situation involving human trafficking, do not hesitate to call the police. The Village of Ameritic Board of Trustees proclaimed today, October 20th, as the first annual Community Media Day. This annual celebration was founded in Brooklyn, New York, and helps bring awareness to the importance of free speech and accessible media for all individuals. Community Media Day falls in line with Free Speech Week 2016 that runs from October 17th through the 23rd. LMC TV opened its doors to showcase what we do best, bringing you community news stories. Here's Kayla Coglin with What's Trending in the Media. Marchmont resident Lisa Kawiko and president of the City College of New York has been in the news recently, but not for the best of reasons. Kawiko resigned from CCNY, and although she did not give a reason, many believe it is because of how her administration has been handling over $150,000 of personal expenses. The former CCNY president is currently under investigation. For more information on the situation, go to the Mamaroneck Daily Voice. Now some good school news. Niche.com has listed Mamaroneck school districts among the top 100 best places to teach in New York. To make this list, researchers at Niche.com considered teacher salaries, experience, and attendance, as well as the school security, resources, and academics. You can find the full write-up on the Larchmont Mamaroneck patch. On the health and exercise front, Balanced Yoga and Wellness in Larchmont is excited to show off the new and improved studios. Owners Dave and Carolyn Frost completely renovated the studio and it now has so much more to offer. From bringing in a better sound system to hiring new instructors, Balanced Yoga and Wellness has made amazing improvements. I've only mentioned a few little things, so go to the Mamaroneck Daily Voice to learn about all the different classes and programs Balanced Yoga and Wellness has to offer. The village of Mamaroneck has welcomed a beautiful new addition to the streetscape. It's a mural by local artist Piero Manrique entitled Free. The Arts Council asked Piero Manrique to paint the mural for the Arts Live initiative. Manrique's work is famous throughout the United States, but if you want to get a taste of his art, head over to 630 Mamaroneck Avenue. To learn more about Manrique and about the Mamaroneck Arts Council, visit the Larchmont Mamaroneck patch. It's October, so I have to get into some creepy news. Buckout Road in West Harrison has been the subject of all types of horror stories for years. While this local legend may be coming to the big screen, John Pascucci, a filmmaker from New Rochelle, created a screenplay based on Buckout Road, and a cast and crew have already been in development. To learn more about the project and the story of Buckout Road, go to the Mamaroneck Daily Voice. If you can find it online, you can find it right here in the media. I'm Kayla Coglin. <laughs> It's time for some local trivia, then on tonight's roundtable, we'll chat Domestic Violence Awareness Month with Jennifer Friedman of My Sister's Place. October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. President Obama has called upon all Americans to speak out against domestic violence and to support local efforts to assist victims of those crimes. I'm Maura Carlin, alongside Mike Witch. Our guest this evening is from My Sister's Place in Westchester, and they are committed to that endeavor. We're going to learn more tonight about what we can all do. And as always, we hope you'll join the conversation. You can ask questions. You can give your opinions. We want to hear from you. You can call us, email, or tweet. 
The contact information is on your screen. And here with us is Jennifer Friedman, the director of the Center for Legal Services at My Sister's Place in White Plains. But before we get to talking, we're going to watch a videotape. It's a pattern. Control. Power. Fear. Intimidation. Isolation. Abuse. Emotional. Physical. Digital. Financial. Sexual. Domestic violence is intimate partner abuse. One in four are affected. It doesn't discriminate by gender, sexual identity, economic status, race, ethnicity, or religion. It can be loud. Or it may be a whisper. It might be on the surface. Or it could be in disguise. My sister's place. My sister's place. My sister's place. My, My sister's, sister's place. place. Jennifer, the President's or the White House's proclamation includes some stats. Am I have them right that nearly one in four women and one in seven men experience domestic violence. And these numbers, they say, are after a 75% drop in the last two decades. Now, if I did math correctly, for women, that means a decline from one in three to one in four, which is still pretty large. Is domestic violence that common here in Westchester County? Thank you so much for asking me that question. I think that um, when I tell people that I work at my sister's place, so many people say, oh, really? Is domestic violence a problem in Westchester? Do we need to be concerned about this? And you would be, it absolutely is a problem, and you would be so surprised probably to know the people who may be your neighbors, maybe your friends, people who you go to church or synagogue with who are grappling with the reality of domestic violence, or you can also use the term intimate partner violence, in their lives. Um, as we know, there have been um, homicides in our community in Westchester in the past several years, and suddenly everyone looks up and gets very, very concerned, and then often it gets swept back under the rug after a terrible incident such as that. But the reality is that it is happening every single day, and we know because we get the phone calls in our office. Are the phone calls from mostly from women or men, or is it equal? It's mostly women. Uh, I think that it's a reality that intimate partner violence impacts women more um, at a higher rate than mm -hmm. men, but absolutely we do have male clients and we are open to treating all people, assisting people from any ethnicity, uh, irrespective of gender, um, we, are, we are here to serve Westchester County. Are there particular groups that are more subject to, you know, more likely to experience domestic violence than others? You know, I think there are a lot of stereotypes out there about that. Uh, the reality is that domestic violence impacts people from every race, every ethnicity. Uh, we have a large immigration practice uh, in the legal center at my sister's place, and we see people from all over the world. From and, and it's amazing the similarities that you see between someone from South America, someone from Africa, someone from Europe, someone from East Europe, West Europe. I mean, there, the, there are patterns of power and control that are absolutely um, across, again, gender, ethnicity, race, international. Um, it's a gender-based crime, and that's what we see. So it's, it's, not, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not just cultural for, from, uh, in terms of immigrants. No, when you say cultural, I mean, what I would say is um, virtually every culture that I've encountered has an element of domestic violence there. It has to do with the abuse of power and the use of control. Um, and so, really, it can be cultural in the sense that certain cultures engage in certain practices, um, but the sad fact is that it's American. It's part of our culture. Dem violence against women or intimate partner violence, we see it everywhere we look in our culture. Is there a certain type of person or personality who's more likely to be subjected to it? Actually, I get asked that question periodically, and the truth is, I like to flip that question around. The reality is that there's a personality type of an abuser, more so than there's an abu a personality type of a victim, because when someone is stripped of their feeling of self-worth by being emotionally abused, physically abused, by being isolated from friends and family. Of course that person may become depressed, may become more shy or, or more retired, you know, um, less uh, confident, but I don't find that it's really about people who are unconfident end up being victims. What I find is that there's this unbelievable turnaround in our clients' lives, and once they're free from domestic violence and they're 
able to find safety and independence, it's like a light goes on and someone who you might think was shy or you know, seemed in some way to be um, you know, downcast can become confident and ebullient and, and we see that, we see that trajectory um, from kind of hopelessness to hope all the time. So what I ask more is, well, what is the personality type of an abuser? Who feels badly about, enough about him or herself that that person needs to subject someone else to power and control? So tell us about My Sister's Place, what it does sure. and who it serves. Sure, so we're um, a multifaceted holistic agency. We have two shelters where um, women and men can go to live on an emergency basis for a period of months while they are getting back on their feet and usually have a need for safety reasons to be hidden from their, the abuser, the abusive partner. Um, so shelter is a major aspect of what we do. We have a 24-hour hotline. We have counseling services for adults and children. And then my particular role is as director of the legal center, which has a staff of 12 who assist um, victims of intimate partner violence in family law and in immigration law. And you've been at this since... Oh, and, and I, have to, I can't forget, <laughs> we have a fantastic community education and prevention program where we have really dynamic community educators who go out primarily into the high schools mm -hmm. and train our high school students all around Westchester on healthy relationships, how to have them and how to identify unhealthy dynamics and what to do about it. And you've been in business since 19... We're, we're actually just celebrating our 40th anniversary uh, in 2017. So yeah, 40 years. So what are the legal options? You know, the legal help. Sure, sure. So what people usually think about is orders of protection, right. which makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that the two major ways to accomplish getting an order of protection is by calling the police and initiating a criminal case. Um, so when someone is arrested and arraigned um, on a domestic violence allegation, uh, there is an order of protection issued. So accessing that resource is so important and when people are in fear for their lives or for their safety, calling the police is a really important option to be aware of. And then the other option is family court. And orders of protection can be granted by family court judges on the basis of making an allegation. And this is a civil forum, it's not criminal mm -hmm. court, no one's gonna go to jail, um, but it's the option is to create safety. And if you make allegations of a domestic violence offense, you can ultimately receive an order of protection in family court as well. Okay, not to be cynical, yes. but a piece of paper doesn't exactly protect you. Right. So what other steps might one have to take? Right, absolutely. And our entire philosophy is very, very victim-centered and trauma-informed. So we are looking at each individual case and what is going to work the best for that person. It may be for that person that being completely hidden and getting off the grid is the right thing to do and going into shelter and not getting an order of protection is the right result. Um, it may be that the abuser is very um, conscious of being law abiding, doesn't wanna, you know, if, if an order of protection is violated, then in addition to the underlying allegation, there's also criminal contempt, which is violation of an order. So some, each individual situation is very different. Some people are very more likely to abide by an order of protection and some are not. Um, so, so, and sometimes you're doing that in tandem with other safety planning. And safety planning is the bedrock of all domestic violence services, legal or counseling. Um, and the most important thing is to think about how can we keep this person safe? What are her options? Um, and calling a hotline and talking to a trained domestic violence counselor about how to stay safe is the most important thing to do. There's not a one size fits all answer. We actually we have a um, an emailed question. Oh sure. <laughs> What's the probability of children from domestic violence or homes homes where there mm -hmm. has been domestic violence? How likely is that that they themselves will end up in an abusive relationship, either as the abuser or the abused? Right. So there absolutely is research that. Um, indicates that the likelihood of their people call it the cycle of violence or you know the generational cycle of violence um, that children who are exposed to domestic violence are at a greater risk of being a victim or a perpetrator in the future and um, and that is sad and unfortunate and it's one of the reasons why um, 
in, for example, our family law practice, we are so, so focused on the protection of children and trying to enable our clients to remove themselves from situations um, and remove their children from a home in which their children are being exposed to, even if it's just um, verbal abuse, it's very damaging. Um, we have so much more research now about trauma, and when I say we're trauma-informed, we understand that when people and children are exposed to trauma, that there is there is a physiological response to that, and that it impacts people's brains, mm -hmm. and that um, many victims experience this similarity to PTSD, where they're triggered by things that remind them of the violence, and, and this is, these are, um, psychological impacts that can last for a lifetime. Uh, so we're very, very focused on protecting children and um, you know, protecting the, the parents. Have you come up with an, un a, an understanding of, a better understanding of what takes victims so long mm -hmm. to report, to come out, to seek help? That's such a good question. Uh, you know, there, there's a data out there that shows that it takes victims an average of seven times attempting to leave before they finally leave. That's an average. Some people leave very quickly. Others are, are in, in um, marriages that, that can last decades. Um, and some people never leave. I think we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to help people to leave? Okay, because I think that um, the clients who we see who, are, who feel really trapped in violent relationships, first of all, often there's children. They have, this is the, 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 often the father just in a typical gender situation of their children, and they don't want to break up their family, and they don't want to be blamed and feel guilty about the idea that they broke up their family. Um, even though, of course, you can say, well, it's the violence that's causing the impetus for why that would have to happen. In the end, she often feels, so that is the number one reason. There are often threats, threats to kill her, her children, their pets. Pet, pet abuse is, is very highly correlated mm -hmm. with domestic violence. So, you know, it, 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 it sounds, oh, why don't you just leave? Well, if your life is threatened, that's a very, very serious um, consideration, particularly threats to take children. For our immigrant clients, threats of deportation. Um, so it, it, it's very real, the, the fear that our clients experience in whether they feel that they can take those steps and also the psychological abuse that I was talking about before. Isolation is one of the most effective ways to leave a victim without feeling that she has options. So if she's out of touch with her family or her close friends, doesn't have options, and then economic abuse impacts that as well because you're asking mm -hmm. the question, well, what are the resources you would need to leave? I'm a mom of two or three children. Where am I going to live? How am I going to eat? How am I going to feed my children? These are very, very real considerations, and these are the factors that keep people locked in very um, unhealthy situations. People outside of the relationships are often reluctant to interfere. Mm -hmm. um, what should you do if you suspect someone you know mm -hmm. is being abused? Because, it's, yeah. you know, you're kind of like, not my business. Right. Well, you know, it's it's so interesting because I feel like our children's generation are really learning so much more about bystander accountability. And mm -hmm. so I think that in our generation, we thought, oh, that's personal. That's not my business. And I really um, embrace the notion that, you know, if you really believe that something really problematic may be going on, the real, I would say, the best thing to do is to talk to the person who you think may be experiencing the situation in a safe way because anything you do might trigger a violent response from the abuser. So if the abuser thinks that the neighbors or the friends or the family are onto them, it can actually increase the danger level. And so I think that there is, there is that val valid consideration that needs to be. So it's, what can I do to help you? I'm here to listen talk to me, I'm here to be supportive. I know about my sister's place, maybe you wanna call them. Um, they have a hotline, they have specialists who can help or just be an open ear. Um, I think that, that non-judgmentalness is crucial because people do feel so judged mm -hmm. and they're afraid to kind of out themselves. Um, so it's a great question, there is no one right answer, but I think being open and non-judgmental and providing, saying I am here for you. 
before we go on, I want to make sure you give out the hotline number. Oh, of course, yes, and, I have it right here. And the email address, uh, the website, yes. and any other contact information. So it's 1-800-298-SAFE, S-A-F-E, 1-800-298-7233. And that's and this the hotline. Is, this is the hotline, and you can access any of our services by accessing the hotline. This is a little card that we have that we call a palm, palm card, and the idea is that it's very small mm -hmm. and that it can fit in in um you know in a, in a safe place um, and our website is www.mspny like my sister's place new york.org and there are many resources available on our website as well is there a phone number if that if in the office that people can just call and just get information about where you are or Sure. Or, uh, or would you prefer they call the hotline? Uh, or go to the website for the information. Yeah. Probably the website is the best place to go for mm -hmm. information. And then if people need additional information, of course, they can call our office and our phone number is on the website. So that's probably okay. the best way to access us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. I, I'd like to pivot slightly. Sure. Um, what about issues of, let's say, abusive claims of abuse? Mm -hmm. particularly in divorce cases. We could talk about Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, mm -hmm. you know, or any number of, you had Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who, you know, what's right and what isn't, but there are questions about it coming up in divorce cases. What do you find? Well, absolutely. I mean, what's really, really troubling is when the wrong, when, when the non-victim is claiming abuse and it's been really damaging to the real victims uh, mm -hmm. that there has been this um, kind of sometimes a manipulation of the system. And one of the things that's really troubling is that um, particularly in the case of um, allegations of child sex sexual abuse, that the courts have become so um, concerned about um, false claims that there's been a backlash where mothers are concerned or parents who are the parent of a victim child are so concerned about bringing the case forward because what the judge will do is they'll say, well, you are engaging in parental interference. Mm -hmm. And in ultimately, the parent who's alleging the conduct can actually lose custody because oh, they have wow. brought forth what is then thought to be a false claim. And so it's really dampened victims wanting to come forward with those allegations. So it's a shame if and when false allegations exist because it undermines the veracity of the real allegations that, that really are out there. Um, I mean, I can't really, you know, <laughs> in terms of the famous people <laughs> yeah. and, they're, and they're, uh, they, they are all lawyered up and have probably very effective counsel who can defend <laughs> right. their positions, um, unlike our clients who are generally low income and need our, our legal services um, mm -hmm. well, at no cost. There is one famous person these days, Donald Trump, mm -hmm. who has allegations made against him and has also made some comments in his uh, electioneering. And uh, has that had an impact on the number of calls you've received? Yes, yes. yes. Across the country, um, people are coming out of the woodwork to tell their stories. It really is, a, a, you know, it, it's obviously very sad that it exists, but people who have been holding on to their stories for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, when they see this happening, it, it, it becomes um, like a, they feel like they, they, that, it, that it's time to mm -hmm. come forward and they feel almost like they have the permission to come forward because it's in the zeitgeist, right? Um, and so we are seeing this spike in calls to sexual assault hotlines, um, particularly in the, in the case of sexual assault, um, which we serve, of course, many of our clients are, are victims of, of, of many types of abuse, including mm -hmm. sexual assault. There's a very high rate of, of, of you know, co-incidence of um, sexual assault and, and domestic violence. Or, intimate partner violence. But absolutely, people are coming forward with their stories. Um, I hate to use a cliche, but I do have a little bit of the where there's smoke, there's fire analysis. Um, in my work, when I hear people tell their stories, I know the truth of people's stories. You can hear, you can see, you can feel people's truth when they speak it. And I think that it is it is so important that we believe people who come forward with their stories because it is actually quite brave to reveal, certainly to the public, something so personal. 
we're going to do one final pivot, sure. which is something that mm -hmm. is on my sister's place's website, mm -hmm. um, your efforts in human trafficking. Yes. And there was just, an, uh, I just read news, and I think mm -hmm. we've even reported on it, about um, a teenager who was rescued. Mm -hmm. That really exists around here. I mean, I, I was does. taken back. It does. You know, it's, there's, there's, when you're in a suburban, and actually there are obviously urban areas of right. Westchester, um, but you have this idea of you know New York City from the 1970s, and that's your image of sex trafficking. That, but that's not what it looks like in a place like Westchester. It looks like um, a building you might walk by a million times and not know what's really going on inside. It looks like a massage parlor, mm -hmm. um, you know. And uh, there are usually underage, you know, young girls being transported from. Um, many of them from inside the United States, from other parts of the United States, um, many also from other countries. And this is, this is a really sad but a, a true reality. Um, my sister's place is the designated human trafficking um, agency for the Lower Hudson Valley region, and so we are the go-to um, okay. source for law enforcement and for other victim service agencies when they identify cases of human trafficking. And we actually handle labor, labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking, um, and 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 we help a lot of people. You provide the same kind of support, housing and counseling. Absolutely, shelter, and counseling, legal services, yes, across the board, case management and some financial assistance, yeah. And if people want to get involved or help, <laughs> they should go to your website? They should go to our website, mspny.org, and we welcome volunteers and anyone who is interested in joining our work. Oh. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, you can get more information at On My Sister's Place at mspny.org. And please stay with us. We'll be back with more community stories and the answer to that trivia question. Welcome back to The Local Live, I'm Ann Sachs. And I'm Ken Reichman. It's been an exciting week in local sports, the final week of the fall 2016 regular season. First, we'll take a look at senior night for the Mamaroneck girls soccer team, Ian. A battle of Tigers as Mamaroneck played host to White Plains. Pick it up in the first half, Julia Siklik receives a cross but boots the shot wide. After a scoreless first, Olivia Rodriguez tries this one from long range only to have it saved. Moments later, Charlotte Golden nearly sneaks it inside the post. Let's take another look at it. Incredible, the ball just strikes the post and bounces out as the game remains scoreless. Another near goal here for the hometown Tigers as Rodriguez again has her shot saved. But then Rodriguez does find the back of the net, giving Mamarinik the first score of the game. That goal would stand as the only one of the game as goalie Lily Epstein makes the fingertip save to keep White Plains off the board. Let's look at it again. She reaches across her body to prevent the goal as Mamarinik takes the 1-0 victory. Well, Ken, what a game there. Both goalies looking strong, but it just takes one to separate the victors from the losers. Uh, you said it perfectly, Ian, and that was the case this past Monday. The Mamaroneck field hockey team hosting a Scarsdale team that beat them 4-0 in the season opener, but that's in the past. This second matchup decided the league champion and the top seed for the playoffs. We'll pick it up in the second half. Still scoreless when Emma Schwartz redirects the feed from Aaron Nicholas to give the Raiders a 1-0 lead. The Tigers will answer, however. Just a minute later, it's Elizabeth Brissett off a penalty corner, and the game is tied. And with under five minutes to go, Brissett says, thanks, sir, I'll have another. And she puts the Tigers up 2-1, to one, but not for too long because the Raiders won't go quietly into the night. It's Jilly Melman who tickles the twine to tie this one up with two minutes to play. So, as time expires, the Tigers are awarded a penalty corner. They need a win to get top seed in league championship. A tie gives both to Scarsdale, so it all comes down to this final play. The Tigers on the corner. 
will pass it around. It's Brissett who throws it towards the goal. Molly Banks is the one who gets it to go for the win. And in stunning fashion, Mamaronek takes the league championship and top seed for the Section 1 Class A playoffs. Let's hear from Tigers coach John Savage on the game winner. And Sophie Miller got the ball, threw out Erin Nichols, who is one of the best players in the section and gets out real fast. And we thought if we could get her coming out, we could send the ball across to E, and then E could either drive it to the opposite post or send it to the opposite post where Mo Molly Banks needed to be. And Molly was there, E sent it, and Molly finished it. So it, it pretty much as we drew it up, they did it. How about that? The two-time defending state champions finish with a record of 13-1-2. and two. And really, Ian, can anyone stop them from winning another title? Well, I think there's a good chance that they'll see Scarsdale again in the sectional final. Perhaps their toughest test to win another state title. But if they get the section title, I say all bets are off for them going to states. Well, folks, that'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can watch full broadcasts of LMC Varsity Sports games every weekend on LMC TV. Cablevision Channel 77, Verizon Fios 34, and on demand at lmctv.org slash sports. New Rochelle has two new rising culinary stars. They sat down with Rebecca Pagnini to chat about their competitive bake-off cake wars. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today we have two very special guests in studio that I am so excited about. We have Jacqueline Dinko, creator of Caked Out Creations, and Natasha Jagopat, creator of Bake My Day NYC. So ladies, as I understand, you had a really exciting past few months because you were part of Cake Wars, right? Yes. <laughs> and what channel is that on? The Food Network. The Food Network. And yeah. can you tell me a little bit about that experience, maybe for our viewers who don't watch the show? Sure. So. We have four different teams competing against each other to make extravagant cakes in less than an hour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you could win $10,000. Oh, okay. So it's four teams competing, four teams of two? Yes. Okay, cool. And you pick your own partner, right, when you're accepted? Yes. And you started the application process, yes, Natasha. I did. And how did that go for you? Um, I saw the, the ad for Cake Wars on Facebook, and I figured, since everyone was telling me, you know, you need to be on the show, I had nothing to lose, I figured I'll just give it a shot. So I sent in my application, and that was it. That's so awesome. And you're a Nersha local, correct? Yes. Awesome. You grew up here and everything. Born and raised. And you live here still? Yes, I do. Oh, that's so awesome. And how did your passion for the two of you, how did it start? How did you get into baking? For me, I used to do it for fun. And then I took recreational classes at the Institute of Culinary Education in the city. And I just fell in love and I started doing decorating classes. And I was like, this is something I want to do. And I decided to do it full time and go to school. And I graduated and I became a certified pastry chef at the Star, um, Star Institute of Culinary Education in Syosset. Oh, that's awesome. And your training? I'm more of self-taught. I started on maternity leave. And I started baking cupcakes for just friends and family, and then I made my first cake, and the rest is history. That's I never so turned awesome. back. And what for the two of you, what do you like prefer? Do you like baking like the base of the cake more, or is it more the decoration that's fun? Like, what's the best part? I'm more of a decorator. I prefer yeah. doing sculpted, more intricate, detailed things. I'm very detailed with my work. I love being able to play with flavors, like playing around with it and making sure. I, I like I like it both the yeah. same I think yeah because I'm always like Shh, bake me the cake and I'll ice it <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome and um, you mentioned that on the show you guys were baking alongside some of your idols what was that like I mean that must have really added to the nerves well for that particular show um, we actually didn't bake with any of our idols oh, but right. a lot of our <laughs> idols I'm sorry a lot of our idols. Um, have competed and we were a little bit worried not knowing who we were competing against <laughs> right. that we were going to have to compete against them because they're amazing and they're who we look up to to learn what we're learning and you know for our businesses so it was a little scary at first um, yeah one of the competitors was a previous winner of cake wars so that was a little nerve-wracking yeah because she was amazing so yeah well that's good set a fire under you yeah <laughs> and your story especially is a huge inspiration, I think, for people who um, 
you know, maybe have a passion for something, but didn't didn't think it could be lucrative. You know, just beyond baking, even beyond anything culinary, just something that you never really thought to pursue, but you loved it. And do you have any advice for people like that? Um, I would say just if you really love something and you feel it in your heart, don't give up. Keep going. Keep fighting for it. You know, don't let anything or anyone get in your way. Because before you started baking, you were a nurse, correct? Yes. I'm still a registered nurse, but I kind of gave it up for a little bit for, you know, this experience just to see if I really wanted to do this or go back to nursing. Awesome. And you so. guys are both focused on competing as of right now, right? Yes. yes. Competing in sort of uh, like private work, like someone could contact you. Right? Yes. They can go on our website or Instagram and get our info. So we do make custom cakes, cupcakes, right? Yeah. My focus Bake right my now. day. <laughs> Caked out. My my focus right now is competing. Um, we're both entering the Great American Cake Show this weekend in Maryland. Oh, cool! Um, this is her first competition outside of Cake Wars. So yeah. I know she's nervous. Doing it with doing it with Jackie. She's just getting me out of my comfort zone for everything. Good, you need that. Yeah. Someone so, to push you. I'm also focusing on teaching classes now. I do private and group classes, and I'm teaching um, kids classes at Anna's Treehouse in New Rochelle. It's a preschool. Mm. Yeah, you have a very heavy focus in, in children. Can you tell me a little bit about Icing Smiles, the two of you? Sure. Yeah. Icing, well, we donate to Icing Smiles. It's a nonprofit organization, and we donate um, dream cakes to kids with chronic illnesses as well as their siblings. Oh, that's so nice. So basically the parents would contact you guys and describe um, their child? Yeah, they go through Icing Smiles. And someone in Icing Smiles will send us the email or send your their local baker an email. Who, they'll send it out to several people who's in the area. And, yeah. and you can accept and then you'd have to make the cake whatever the child wants. You, you got to create this like beautiful dream cake for them. And it's an amazing, amazing experience. Oh, yeah, that must be really rewarding. It is, yeah. absolutely. Oh, nice. Sweet. Pun intended. <laughs> 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 and what about Cupcakes for a Cure? Show me anything about that. Um, cupcakes for a Cure is held annually to benefit the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and that's done at the Westchester Mall. Um, and a whole bunch of bakeries come and they bake all different cupcakes, and then they sell them and they raise money for the organization. Wow, that's so awesome. And you truly, I mean, you're an inspiration on a ton of levels, self-starter, and you're, you're also a cancer survivor, right? Yes, pediatric cancer survivor. So oh, really? So that's a really big cause for me and it's very close to my heart. What made you want to, you know, bake a difference? Like, I mean, I guess obviously just your life experience in general. I mean, is there anything else in particular that just made you realize like, wow, not only can I do a job that I love, but I can contribute? For me, it was similar to being a nurse. You know, you get to be compassionate and meet different kids going through different experiences. And it was just something that I, I really loved about this industry and baking because that, some people think you just bake a cake and that's it, but you really get to give back and make a difference in these kids' lives. I mean, they are so appreciative and the families are amazing. And there's some sad stories that go with it, but you know, putting a smile on their face is number one. So for me, um, it was never about winning. It was really just about challenging myself and like she said, stepping out of my comfort zone and doing something that I wouldn't normally do, but I knew I wanted to do. I mean, most people don't apply for the money to win. They apply because it's an experience and you know it really gets you out there and it gives you the opportunity to really challenge yourself, which is part of competing in general with the cake community. Right, So, and any future plans? I mean, I know you said you're looking for a storefront. Anything else you guys have in the works or you have the Bake Off coming up, right? Um, I don't have a Bake Off coming up. Or well, the, weekend, the, competition. the competition. Oh, the competition, right. yes. We are going to Maryland this weekend. Hopefully we can collab on something in the future. And yeah, you guys um, seem yeah. to have a great thing going. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're thinking about it. We're yeah. working on it. But we I work am really looking. well together, so hopefully. Nice. And what about you? Um, my focus right now, like I said, is competing and teaching the classes because I really want to be able to offer my skills to a lot of the kids and the, even the parents in the community because they all want to learn how to make cakes for their kids. Right. Um, and I'm in the process of moving forward with opening my own store, hopefully in Nourishell. That is what I'm looking for. Um, and I just want to be able to give back to my community because we don't have that in Nourishell. And, you know, all of my supporters are there. And 
I really want to give them back something. That'd be nice. Keep it all within Absolutely. where you grew up. Yeah, nice. I wear purple. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. That's so awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much. This has been a blast. I cannot wait to see how things pan out for you guys. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you thank for having you. us. It was an honor to be here. Yes. So keep watching, guys, because up next we have Westchester's annual tattoo convention. And guess what? I was there. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>
We are always welcoming new interns and volunteers, so send us your emails to the local live at lmctv.org. And join us. We love hearing from you. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Moral Kathwari. And I'm Alexandra Garcia. See you next week for another episode of The Local Live.